Hi, Danny. How are you doing? Good. I'm Sarah Posner. This is The Posner Show, and my guest today is Daniel Seidman. He is an attorney, an Israeli attorney in Israel, and he specializes in issues relating to uh, Jerusalem, uh, relations between Israelis and Palestinians, real estate issues, and so on and so forth. Um, so today we're talking, uh, while well, here in the U.S. at least, and I'm guessing over there too, Jeffrey Goldberg's chicken shit article is being <laughs> much discussed. Uh, What's your sense of how that was received on the Israeli end? Probably too early to say. Um, it has to sink in. Obviously, there's been bad blood between the prime minister and uh, the president for quite some time. This is a new peak. Um, the initial response is to draw the wagons into a circle and to uh, fend off um, the attackers of Israel. And then it begins to sink in that we are sliding into abject isolation. Israelis do not like their prime ministers to pick fights with the president of the United States. Okay. So do you think that it is starting to sink in or do you think a defensiveness is, would, would be the reaction I mean, that was, that, was, that was Netanyahu's reaction, and that was Bennett's reaction. And that's to be expected, uh -huh. and I think that they will pursue it. But uh, after the initial knee-jerk response, um, I think that people's thinking becomes clearer. I think that the um, major obstacle to perceiving what's going on is not the Mitzada complex. It's the cafes in Tel Aviv and the malls in Rishon LeZion. It's the Israeli escapism, and given an opportunity, we will sip cappuccino on the edge of a volcano. Um, but uh, when you have President Rivlin, who is from the revisionist camp, uh, saying there are three priorities that Israel has in its foreign policy, and those are good relations with the United States, good, good relations, relations with, with the United, United States, States, and good relations right. with the United right. States. Uh, that is a searing criticism being posed very politely. So I think that we are uh, witnessing a learning process within the Israeli public. Interesting. So uh, let's talk about some of the events that led up to Goldberg's article and contributed to the frustration uh, that was expressed by, expressed anonymously, I should add, uh, by the Obama administration officials to... What's your guess? What's your guess? Who is it? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a guess. I mean, because I think that mm -hmm. the use of the particular term chicken shit was um, probably not the, the best choice because I'm not even sure it's the most accurate choice because I'm not well, sure... There's been a lot of discussion going on. This has really improved uh, Israeli etymology. We, there's been a lot of discussion, <laughs> precise definition of what chicken shit is, and people have been walking around mumbling chicken shit. It's, it's an interesting discourse. <laughs> yes, yes. But I guess the, the, the aim of the chicken shit comment was to paint uh, Netanyahu as cowardly. And sort of embedded in that was that Netanyahu didn't have any... Um, any actual intention of bombing Iran, number one. And number two, that, that Netanyahu was more interested in pandering to his political base than anything else, and that's what made him a coward. So, you know- I think he's been more interested in pandering to the Republican political base in the United States, which is even <laughs> problematic. <laughs> right, exactly. But also the idea that a politician is pandering, you know, isn't exactly news and, you know, not necessarily evidence of cowardice. And I'm not sure that what might be considered restraint from bombing another country would also be considered as cowardice. I mean, I think that the Obama administration should be glad that he's not <laughs> bombing around. But um, in any case, um, I don't have any guesses whatsoever about who, who it might be. Um, but I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't sure that the use of the term was accurately describing what the frustration is. The frustration mm -hmm. is, yes, that he's pandering and that he's going full bore ahead with increased settlement building and not making any 
not only not making any moves to advance a two-state solution, but also making moves that will make a two-state solution impossible. Okay, so I'm not sure that chicken shit is the right word to describe frustration well, with those with those. Uh, there were a number of other juicy adjectives there, so why <laughs> right. you can't. <laughs> exactly. So, okay, so let's talk first. There were, there were a few things that I wanted to talk about. Um, I wanted to talk about what's going on in Silwan. Um, I want to talk about the Temple Mount in particular also, and then just more generally, um, the uh, construction permits in East Jerusalem, um, not, ne- not the ones not in Silwan. Uh, and just to give people the background of what it is, I, th- I think that perhaps people have seen the statements coming from the White House and coming from the State Department talking about how um, these settlement activities are illegitimate and we're opposed to them. And the European Union has been critical of them. But let's get to the nitty gritty of what is actually going on um, mm-hmm. in these places. You're the expert. And um, I'm hoping that you can explain uh explain what's going on to everyone who's watching this. So let's start, I guess, with Silwan. Um, Mm -hmm. And why don't you explain Silwan's location and its importance in terms of um, the old city uh, and what has been going on in recent weeks, which is not necessarily new in manner, but some of the particulars are new. Mm -hmm. Well, Silwan, the name derives from the Hebrew term Shiloach. Um, the pool of Siloam for Christians. Mm -hmm. It is the slope that descends from the southern ramparts of the old city, which means that looming over Siloam is uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque, Haram al-Sharif, the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's not only because of the geographical proximity that Siloam is at the epicenter, uh, but because of its own history. Now, The area of Silwan is very large, it's several square kilometers, um, and it's an amorphous geographical area. Uh, But the area in question is one part of Silwan, known to the Palestinians as Wadi Khilwe, and known to us as David, City of David. Mm -hmm. And this is the Jebusite Ridge upon which Jerusalem developed. Now, there are huge scientific debates about the historicity, from what period was this Jerusalem? Don't want to get into it. But it is fair to say that from the 7th or 8th century BC, Silwan was biblical Jerusalem in ways that the old city wasn't. Um, So uh, in addition to that, it is also a contemporary Palestinian neighborhood, um, uh, part of a larger area of Silwan. Um, as such, Silwan, since um, I would say the late 1980s, early 1990s, in many ways has been the epicenter of the conflict in Jerusalem. It's Axis Mundi. All of the components of the conflict are condensed there, and we're talking about an area that's on the order of 30 or 35 acres. It's tiny, but in this area, it is all there. You have the displacement of Palestinian families by questionably legal means, and in this case, I'm not speaking about the latest acquisitions, put them aside for a moment. You have the transfer of virtually every governmental asset, and we're talking about the family jewels, probably the most important archeological and national sites in the land of Israel, lock, stock, and barrel to settler organizations. So if you go to the national park, which is in, in name run by the Antiquities Authority, the National Parks Authority, you pay an entrance fee and you get a receipt from the settler organizations. You have the archaeology of uh, virtually all of it taking place under the direct or indirect uh, funding or auspices of the settler organizations. Uh, and, the you goal, have, and the goal of the archaeology or of the archaeological dig is to establish that this was the original city of David, referring to King David of the Bible. I, I would say the goal, the goal is multiple. Mm-hmm. And here I will quote 
um, my friends in the settler organizations. And by the way, I don't use the term lightly. I spent the better part of my adult life trying to stop the civil settlement enterprise because I think it's a stain on Israeli democracy and I think it, is a, it jeopardizes the Zionist enterprise. But for some odd reason, the settlers and uh, myself have remained cordial, um, maintained cordial relationships, and we do talk. Um, they intend to turn Silwan or this area of Silwan into an extension of the Jewish border of the old city and to do so by basically recreating a what I call a pseudo biblical realm it will be a Jewish neighborhood uh, they are not speaking about throwing all of the Palestinians out but there have been displacements based on a questionably legal means and basically all of the authorities of government uh, have been uh, dedicated to this goal so much so today that the um, I would say the DNA the ideological DNA has been injected into the decision-making authorities of the government of the state of Israel throughout virtually every possible organ of government from the police to the antiquities authority to the Israel land authority to the absentee property custodian to the municipality and governmental authorities which should benefit the entire public have been vested within a extreme or extreme ideologically motivated organizations so that today the public interest and the private sectoral interest of the settlers in Silwan are indistinguishable. Now, uh, it is commonplace uh, in the ideological left to mourn the death of Israeli democracy. I don't buy into that. Right. I think right. that Israeli democracy is a very flawed but a very feisty democracy. And if I will take the liberty, I don't think your democracy is less flawed. Uh, it's probably less feisty. Although, um, it's election time, maybe I'm wrong about that. Right. Um, uh, when you enter Silwan, I think that there should be a sign saying you're now leaving Israeli democracy and entering a regime. Um, uh, this has been the case uh, for probably since 1991, and it has changed over time. Let me give you one small example. When the settlers moved in on September 30th, they didn't call the police. You can guess why. This is conjecture, and probably because they were afraid that the police would say, even though they're very close with the settlers, not now. Things are boiling over right. in Jerusalem. Right. So they went without the police, but they didn't need the police because they have a private security firm that uh, is part of the private security network of East Jerusalem, which is paid for by the Israeli taxpayer to the tune of 20 or $25 million a year, which secures the settlers. And in the absence of any genuine public scrutiny, they basically are doing the bidding of the settler organization. So they have their private police. And I think in some cases with the trappings of a private militia. Um, uh, the, across the way in, um, um, in the second area that was taken over is Beit Yonatan. It's named after a very prominent uh, Jewish American who is apparently very popular with the settler organizations, a little bit less popular in American security circles. Beit Yonatan is named after um, uh, the great Jonathan Pollard. Um, and Beit Yonatan was built without a building permit, and the authorities turned a blind eye, and there are seven stories of illegal building there. And there was a very decent soul, a very courageous person by the name of Yossi Chavili, was the legal advisor to the Jerusalem municipality. So he indicted them. Uh, even though uh, the evidence was sort of made to go away, and he got a conviction, and the settlers appealed, and he got another conviction, and went to the Supreme Court, he got another conviction. And the order is evacuate the house and seal it. Uh, Mayor Barkat decided not to carry it out, even though it is a court order of the, of the Supreme Court. So the Attorney General weighed in and said, when I give a ruling, it is not uh, a kibitzing, it is not a warm recommendation, it is a binding instruction. Evacuate the house and seal it. Barkat ignored it. And when the legal advisor insisted that it be evacuated, he was fired. An Israeli virgin, version of Elliot Richardson of Watergate fame. You don't like the rulings of an attorney general or a special prosecutor, you fire him. Right. They are there. 
the settlers are not above the law. In many ways, they are the law. So, uh, so the, they didn't evacuate this apartment building. No, they're still there. there. And this is one of the areas in which the settlers moved in. Now, we come to the events of last week or right. two weeks ago and three weeks ago. It is in this context that there have been private purchases, and I am willing to concede I have no interest in vilifying the settler organizations or their activists, that these may have been bona fide purchases. And if you bring up the camera very close and say, look, here is somebody selling and somebody buying, even though there are all sorts of shenanigans going on, that is correct. But if you pull the camera back, you see that this is taking place in a immoral, I believe, highly questionable illegally, an enormously probably politically motivated attempt to take an existing France, uh, Palestinian neighborhood in one of the most sensitive sites in the conflict and to turn over these enormously important sites as an ideological trinket to ideologically motivated settler organizations. The, now, I, it took me many years to arrive at the conclusion that Israeli rule over East Jerusalem is occupation. I believe that's the case, and I could explain it perhaps not now. It's a complicated uh, discussion. I arrived at that conclusion. Nowhere is occupation more occupation in Jerusalem than in Wadi Khilwa, city of David Silwan, and nowhere is that occupation more toxic than it is in Silwan. Okay, so you're saying that the uh, acquisition of the apartments, because it's been reported that they were acquired under, I mean, it was a legal private purchase between private parties, but they were acquired with some sort of, you know, perhaps uh, lack of forthrightness in, in terms of what was actually happening. Is that right? Look, uh, these transactions always stink. You know, there's the old Yiddish joke, it's kosher, but it smells. <laughs> um, so the, um, uh, these were done through subterfuge. They were done with straw men, perhaps straw women. Mm -hmm. uh, but national struggles are never vegetarian, okay? So I would not suggest that we do our Mama Teresa impersonations in this context. Mm -hmm. uh, it appears that the transactions were legal. But were it not for the fact that there has been a, and has and continues to be, a massive government effort uh, using massive uh, government resources, the dedication of government powers and authority and their abuse, uh, for decades, continuing to this day, from the prime minister on down, the settler enterprise in Silwan would not be. So to come along and say, shucks, this is open housing in Chicago right, right, uh, in right, the 1950s right. is not disingenuous. It's Orwellian. Mm -hmm. There is no place where basic um, obligations of fiduciary duties, due process, equal protection under the law, has been abused systematically than in Silwan. And to come along and say, hey, they bought this, which is correct, it is correct, entirely misleading, and entirely beside the point. Now, a bit about the implications of this, yep. because it's yep. a mixed bag. I can tell you almost the time of day when I got involved in Jerusalem stuff. It was on the night between October 9th and October 10th, 1991, when the first settlers moved into Silwan. And it's now 23 years later. Now, on that night, there were, by my estimates, about 1,400 settlers living in settlement enclaves in East Jerusalem, for the most part of the Muslim quarter of the old city. Wait, 23 years later tens if not hundreds of millions of uh, Israeli shekels being devoted to this, all of the authorities of the Israeli government, and there are now 2,500 settlers in the settlement enclaves in East Jerusalem, maybe 26, okay? That's amazing. It's a colossal failure. 
the significance of Silwan is not numerical. Okay. There may be, between us and a permanent status agreement, I believe that the settlers of Silwan will need to be extracted. I've told them as much. We argue about it. They know my position. I know theirs. In order to get there, there may be a small civil war in Israel to do that. Should there be an agreement and should there be a majority, which I believe there will be. But the political price of extracting 1,400 settlers as there were in 1991 and 2,600 settlers as there are today, same price. So before we uh, drive ourselves into clinical depression, 2,600 settlers and settlement enclaves, including the 500 in Silwan, will not determine the border between Israel and Palestine. That said, their impact is enormous. Their influence on this is not quantitative, it's qualitative. Right. right. Um, what we are witnessing in and around the old city, particularly in Silwan, but not only in Silwan, in relation to your next subject, the mm -hmm. Temple Mount, is the ascendancy of exclusionary religious narratives. Please note that I'm not saying Jewish narratives because there are Jews, Christians, and uh, Muslims who are all guilty of this. Right. But what we are seeing in the settlement enterprise and things that accompany it is, this is ours. Jerusalem has a biblical past, a biblical present, and a biblical future. And uh, this is a quote, by the way, from Netanyahu. And there's one testament in this Bible, and there is no Koran. And this contains the seeds of a transformation of a political conflict, which can be solved, into a religious conflict, which cannot, which is sort of like a combination of Milchemet Mesva, Holy War, Jihad, Armageddon, the Second Coming, and hopefully in that order, and then we can pack our bags and go home. Now, the Arab world and the Muslim world do not need the settlers of Silwan in order to engage in their own form of radical political Islam, and this is a nasty neighborhood. But they are embracing what's happening here because the nastier wings of the Brotherhood and etc. aspire to uh, a holy war for their own purposes. Right. This is their war. And Sarah Palin can see um, Silwan from her front porch in Alaska. <laughs> Mike Huckabee and um, John Voight spend more time in these places than they do at Jesus' tomb because they see this as their Armageddon playground. And what we're seeing is not the ascendancy of religion. Complaining about the ascendancy of religion is sort of like complaining about culture in Florence and canals and the dampness in, in Venice. No. What I'm, I'm pointing to is what we're witnessing is the ascendancy of those who weaponize faith, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Right. A couple of right. weeks ago during Sukkot, we had the one day when the uh, evangelical end of days dispensationalist Christians come to Jerusalem to celebrate. And on that same day, we had the settlers in uh, or the Temple Mount moving movement trying to get to Haram al-Sharif and the Temple Mount and the pushback of the uh, rioting uh, in and around the Temple Mount. It was a wonderful, pluralistic, egalitarian day in which there were Jewish pyromaniacs, Christian pyromaniacs, and Muslim pyromaniacs. I'm sure that God was very pleased. <laughs> well, so I think in the U.S. and in, in, in American politics, all of these issues get condensed down into a discussion of whether, there, whether Jerusalem will be divided, right? And it gets mm -hmm. it gets simplified into that little soundbite about whether there will be a united Jerusalem or a divided Jerusalem. And the right, of course, opposes what they call a divided Jerusalem, meaning mm -hmm. a Jerusalem that would be the capital for a future Palestinian state. Um, but the the ins and outs of how that is being, I mean, isn't that one of the goals here is to establish facts on the ground to make it less possible for there to be a Palestinian state with Jerusalem as, or part of East Jerusalem as its capital. That's the intention. And before, before we get into it, just a word on where Jerusalem stands uh, uh, on this issue, not where I stand, where Jerusalem stands. Well, let's start with where I stand. If you come to me and say, I don't believe an agreement between Israelis and Palestinians is possible. You know, I'll disagree with you vehemently, but I think you can give a very compelling argument. I'm not entirely convinced that, right. that it is. I think right. it is, but I'm not convinced. On the other hand, you come to me and you say, I believe an agreement is possible. However, it's uh, possible with Israel having sole control over the mantra, 
you know what the mantra is, even though you may not know that you know what the mantra is. It's very topical in uh, election season. The mantra is Jerusalem, the other by the capital of Israel, that will never be redivided, which is one word and a noun, and you have to be able to recite it seven times in a row in order to get elected to Congress. So there's a lot of undivided Jerusalem going around these days in right. congressional races. Right. Uh, and if you tell me that you think that Israel will have all of Jerusalem and there'll be an agreement, I don't have any interest in humiliating you. I'll take you aside quietly and I'll listen in your, what are you smoking? Right. Because you're smoking right. something. You're not living in the same universe as me. This conflict ends in a political division of Jerusalem where it doesn't end at all. And the question that arises, is, is it still possible, is it not possible, are the settlers thwarting this? And I suggest we listen to what Jerusalem has been telling us over the last four months. And the answer is unequivocal, and it's a double answer. First part of the answer is, of course it's possible because it's here. The border in Jerusalem exists. Uh, Israelis do not venture, and that's myself. I've been out in the streets of Jerusalem weekly, daily, every day for the last 23 years. I don't go into 90% of East Jerusalem. It's dangerous and I'm not a martyr. And Palestinians don't venture into West Jerusalem or Israeli Jerusalem. The, the, the cognitive border, the de facto border is there and it is exactly where the politicians would put the border were they negotiating in good faith, which they have not been. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to ask, is it possible? Jerusalem says it's here, it's messy, it's bloody, it's, but it's there. That's part of the message. The other message is what's happened in Silwan. Uh, the violence was bubbling under the surface and so on in places like this prior to the eruption of violence on July 2nd. Um, but there was this disingenuous, oh shucks, we get along so well with our neighbors, you know, there's coexistence and so on. It's this idyllic, you know, they knock on the door and they ask for a sugar. We're just folks, they ask for a cup of sugar and we give it to them. Within hours of the murder of Abu Khder, this was Belfast at his worst, and Jerusalem was Hebronized. It is a perpetually hemorrhaging situation. Uh, there are nightly assaults on the settlers. I do not envy them. They've stopped counting the number of rocks and Molotov cocktails that their homes and their cars have absorbed. Um, Jerusalem is showing us what should be, and it's also warning us what could be if the two-state solution is lost. There is no one-state solution. There's a one-state reality, and what the one-state reality is living itself out in Silwan. Now, I believe that there is a ter territorial threat to the two-state solution. I don't think it's in Silwan, uh, because the numbers aren't there. Israel will have to generate the political will to make painful decisions. The numbers in Silwan will not be decisive. In situations like this, when I would rush off when the settlers were taking over another house in mm -hmm. the middle of the night, mm -hmm. I would get there and then five minutes before or five minutes later, the late great Faisal Husseini, the national leader of the Palestinians, would also turn up. And I would be usually very upset. And Faisal was sort of very father, sort of fatherly towards me. And he said, Danny, don't worry. You Israelis are creating facts on the ground. We, the Palestinians, are the facts. That's the situation in Silwan. The territorial threats are taking place in the West Bank and give out the Matos and E1 and other places right. where there's a critical right. mass. What's happening in Silwan is a, a threat of another kind. So, so do you think that when American politicians talk about an undivided Jerusalem, do you think they understand whatsoever what is how how Jerusalem is in reality divided at this moment in as you said a, there's a cognitive border um, and I mean do you think they understand understand that or even understand the geography of of what's there or is this just sloganeering to I can I can I can uh, I can speak uh, with a little bit of experience now uh, several months ago. Um, by some fluke, uh, I was asked to accompany two of the most prominent Republican leaders in the United States, uh, known to everybody. And I was asked to take them on a geopolitical tour of East Jerusalem 
by the way, I have to admit that I engaged in a little bit of child abuse in order to do this. Um, my my uh, youngest daughter, um, who's now in the military, expressed an interest in joining us, and it was possible. She came along, and I uh, I engaged in some manipulative self validation by saying, "This is my daughter, Yael. You may ask her anything you want, but." You may not ask her what she does in the army and where she serves because she's highly classified. So I established my Zionist credentials. Uh, these are people who would never publicly um, admit um, to the possibility of a political division of the city at this point. At this point, they were riveted by what happened. There was a, a process where they began to see whether I was. Uh, some sort of anti-Semite. It's hard because I'm a reserve major in the army and all sorts of things of that nature. Um, riveted, not entirely surprised, um, at times almost willy-nilly disturbed by what they saw. Um, I asked them, do you want Senator Kerry to succeed? I know that you know, he's not in your party. Do you want him to? Do you realize what the price of that is? Uh, they were particularly disturbed, um, and some of these are, at least one of them, was very prominent in um, the religious uh, right in the United States, very prominent. And he saw what was happening around the old city in the Temple Mount, and he was disturbed. One of his colleagues was a very prominent former military person and was equally disturbed about American interests. Uh, there, it's not that their guard was down. It was that they, um, they were willing to engage. Um, so can you tell us who they were? No. Uh, uh, no, they, 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 didn't, they, didn't, they didn't ask me not to, but I would think that that would be a breach of confidence. Okay. I, I want people like that to come back to me. Right. What, what, so what, so what, what was it do you think that they found disturbing? I would say there were two things, or three things. First of all, what they found disturbing was the tra trajectory of the conflict um, was such that it threatens to send the kind of tremors throughout the region that could put American lives in harm's way in terms of the radical, and these are patriots, these are right. good people, right. I don't necessarily agree with, and that disturbed them. It disturbed them when I said, when um, I speak to my friends in APAC, as I do, they speak like me, but they won't let you speak that way, which leads to my third point, and that is I don't want you to agree with me. I don't want people who I can convince in three hours out in the field. I don't want this, that kind of support. This is too serious to be easily convinced. Uh, but the co the conversation that we had uh, for three hours uh, going through Jerusalem in a van is the kind of conversation that is politically suicidal in the United States. And I say, don't agree with me. Make the conversation possible. You know this is an important conversation. I don't think I convinced them. I don't want to convince them. I think I pierced their armor, and I think that they came willing to engage on this. Right. So actually, right. I, I came away encouraged by that. But do you see any sign that the political conversation in the United States could change? Because it's certainly there's certainly no evidence that it changed very much, even even with the Obama administration's um, pointed criticism of Netanyahu's um, government in the past, you know, month or two. So there was, first of all, but, there have been things said. There have been things said in recent weeks. Um, uh, about have been the nature before. of the settlement yes. and Jerusalem, yes. and and uh, when uh, Netanyahu said, "Get the facts straight," and uh, the White House responded, "We did." Yeah. Believe me, I know up close what is known in Washington. I know up close what is known here. Believe me, the White House knows what they're talking about. But but I think that there's something else that's happening here, and it's it's just beginning. But I think it's also encouraging. There are new there's there's a phenomenon that's happening simultaneously in the American public domain politically in the American Jewish community and in Israel. I believe we've spoken about this before, mm -hmm. and that is that 
the ideological right, I'm not talking about the right, I'm talking about the ideological right, is becoming more ideolo ideological, and their ideology is becoming, I have no other word, wackier. And that the schism is no longer between left, right, and center, but between an ideological right which is impervious to um, empirical realities in the United States, the extreme manifestations of the tea, the tea Party. By the way, I also have people who I like and respect on our issues in the Tea Party, mm -hmm. not overly generalizing, within the American Jewish community uh, where the locks are held, uh, keeping out groups like J Street and the, from, from the Conference of Presidents, right. and, right. and in Israel where this is, in many ways, this is a government of settlers and by settlers, even though there are decent souls in the government. And the fact that this is uh, happening simultaneously, I believe, is creating new fault lines. And uh, as a result of that, conversations are appearing and going on uh, in each of these places, which didn't take place before. I know that I am being sought out. I don't like to market my wares. I like to work quietly and just leave me alone and let me get my work done. But if I get... A, a, you know, I'm approached by a Jewish federation in the United States who in the past would stay away from this. Like the third rail, I can't turn them down. And I am seeing increasing evidence of sober conversations. I think that there are subterranean shifts going on. You know, you, I can give you one small example. I don't know if you remember this. I think where, where, where was the Democratic National Convention? It was Charlotte, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Um, and um, uh, when the Democratic Party platform was written, the fellow responsible for it did something that's unthinkable yeah. in these things. He didn't clip and paste. <laughs> and a Jeru and, and Jer undivided Jerusalem or the capital of Israel was in the last platform. It didn't hear. And the Republicans pounced on this anti-Israel, anti-Semitic, dividing Jerusalem, this, that, and the other thing. And as usual, the White House panicked. And they ordered uh, that a floor vote be taken after the platform was sealed, put the Jerusalem language back in. It was brought to a floor vote, and there was a voice vote. And the poor fellow, the, the mayor of Los Angeles, um, apparently is a bit hard of hearing because when it was brought to a vote, there were sound boos. Um, and uh, he said, oh, the eyes have it. Um, it's wonderful that. Uh, you know, people of Los Angeles has elected a mayor with hearing disability. Now, uh, one asks, has the Democratic Party become anti-Semitic? Now, I'm sure that the RJC and others will be built delightful to say, I'm sure that most of the people doing the boy were Jewish. Um, and it had nothing to do with dividing Jerusalem or not dividing Jerusalem. In essence, that was secondary. The real thing is they were fed up of being bullied into a parallel universe by the thought police. They're sick and tired of cracking the whip and stopping to think. And that's happening wherever you look, outside of the ideological right. Outside the I ideological right. But outside. I, would, I would say, as an observer and reporter of the ideological right in the United States, that this has still so much potency. And I think that like an issue, I'm trying to think of an analogous issue, but maybe maybe abortion isn't a good analogous issue. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that, that right. is that the that the mm. the people who are uh, against quote unquote dividing Jerusalem are far more fervent about what they're advocating for than people who see through that as political um you know as just like political sloganeering I, I totally agree with you the analogy that i use is the nra right the people who support the nra have one issue and the people who oppose it have all sorts of issue and that is the fulcrum and the lever by which they uh, obtain their power uh were this a debating society in high school i would be deeply troubled but the, the jerusalem's a real city Yes. And, um, you know, um, it's sort of like a game, a football match between uh, history and politics, and we're at halftime. And at the moment, it's uh, history uh, to politics, nothing. Uh, no, no, politics to history, nothing. I think that we're beginning to see history catch up. Jerusalem. The myth of divided Jerusalem mm -hmm. is collapsing under the weight of its own fictions. Jerusalem is not waiting for the politicians. It's dividing itself. Jerusalem... Um, 
uh, is avenging itself by the people who are selling, you know, cheap baubles of some sort of tawdry, uh, mythical, undivided Jerusalem that does not exist in nature. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I believe that um, that will work in our favor, and that people who treat reality seriously. And I think the overwhelming majority of the American public and the American Jewish community, in spite of the lens through which all of these things has to pass, uh, at the at the end of the day, will understand that Jerusalem will be saved by a political division, that Israeli interests will be assured by a political agreement, um, that without a political agreement, uh, the, the, the recessive self-destructive gene of the Jewish people in destroying our own sovereignty will emerge after having skipped a couple of generations. Uh, a hard look at what it needs to navigate the Jewish state through these treacherous waters will lead them to the conclusion that I've arrived at. Well, okay, so we'll, we'll, two years from now in the end of October of 2016, We'll discuss this again, and we'll see. <laughs> well, um, I don't have a watch. I don't have a clock. I don't have a calendar. If you're dealing with Jerusalem, not for somebody with um, weak knees, a weak constitution, and is in this for instant gratification, you get up in the morning and you do what you have to do, and uh, am I at all assured that two years from now things will be better? Nah. Does it, and does that phase me? No. No. Uh, so okay. So let's let's talk about um, let's talk about the Temple Mount now. Okay. So uh, speaking of the passage of time, so in June I interviewed you for a story uh, about about the Temple Mount, and you told me then that if current trends continue, there will be a significant eruption of violence on the Temple Mount within a matter of weeks and months, and not years. Mm -hmm. I stand by that. And you stand by that, and we're seeing that. Are we seeing that? I don't see, I don't, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, look. Um, we have seen a serious destabilization of the Temple Mount. Um, when you look at the current violence in Jerusalem, there are the detonators, and there are the underlying causes. The detonators could be... Uh, the murder of Abu Khtar, the detonators could be the war in Gaza. The underlying causes are the dysfunctionality of Israeli rule and the kind of occupation it is. The Temple Mount is both. It's both detonator and an underlying cause. And we've seen a serious destabilization there, in spite of the genuine protestations of Netanyahu to maintain the status quo. The status quo has formally been changed quo. and, in essence, has been radically changed. So the status uh, quo is. What we're seeing is prelude. Prelude. What I am talking about is a non-routine violent event. And the trajectory that we are now seeing augurs for a non-routine uh, uh, violent event. Um, Jerusalem's a great, is, is the hometown for uh, people who deal with the apocalypse, okay? I'm not talking in apocalyptic terms, but the question is not whether that will happen. It will happen. I don't have a timeline, whether it's weeks or a few months, but it will happen. The question then will be, will this remain an episodic, um, um, localized event, even though it is not routine, or will it send tremors beyond Jerusalem and to create trends that yeah, and that I can't tell you. So, but for, that's so, where we're so for people who are mm -hmm. unfamiliar with the way this works, so the t the Temple Mount. When you talk about the status quo on the Temple Mount, you're talking about that um, there is no Jewish prayer allowed there, uh, and that it is actually administered by Jordanian authorities, not Israeli authorities. Islamic endowment, the Waqf. And this is something that uh, is troubling to, um, I would say, like a growing number of uh, advocates for Jewish prayer on the Temple Mount. This is an issue that has also reached American politicians who want to uh, curry favor with um, um, the, the right wing of Israel pol politics in the United States. 
um, you know, we talked about this for the story that I did in the spring, how mm -hmm. they're sort of being taught to look at this issue of prayer on the Temple Mount through the lens, through an American lens that tells yeah. them this is a religious freedom issue. This is a human rights Absolutely. issue that Most you can't pray on the it... Temple Mount. But the real reason mm -hmm. why the arrangement is the way it is, is so that um, it's, it's a geopolitical arrangement. It's not an issue. It's not an arrangement that has to do with trying to suppress mm -hmm. somebody's religious rights. I would say that this is Moshe Feiglin and the role of his life impersonating Rosa Parks. Okay. Um, um, let, let me answer your badly, question. Ba badly impersonating. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, let, yeah. Me, let me answer your question with a series of vignettes over time. Now, uh, you mentioned the term status quo, and I wanted to go check. And the word status quo did not apply to the Temple Mount Haram al-Sharif during the British Mandate. Status quo applied to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Church of the Nativity, to Rachel's tomb, and to the Western Wall, not to the Temple Mount, because in all of the various committees, and the Cust Committee was the most prominent of them, there were no Jewish claims to the Temple Mount. There was no demand to open the Temple Mount. There was no demand for prayer on the Temple Mount. And since the Middle Ages, there had been almost universal halachic ruling, you don't go there. Right. Did Jews uh, visit the Temple Mount? Well, yes, but it wasn't much of an issue. For example, we know that Moses Montefiore visited the Temple Mount when he was there, and uh, Baron Rothschild did. The Temple Mount was opened uh, by the Ottomans after the Crimean War as a concession to the West. Okay, It was not a contested site. Okay, And the word status quo applies only to contested sites. Vignette number one. Vignette number two. Third day of the Six Day War, Moshe Dayan arrives at the Temple Mount four hours after it was taken by Israeli paratroopers, and he sees Israeli flags flying from Al Aqsa and from the Dome of the Rock, and he barks, takes those down, never put them up again. We don't need a religious war. And that was the creation of the religious autonomy, that instinctive. Spontaneous decision created the Islamic autonomy, which reflected the status quo. The Temple Mount has been in continuous Muslim control, exclusive Muslim control, since the end of the Crusades. Okay? A month forward, Rabbi Goran, who was one of the few rabbis at the time advocating prayer in the Temple Mount, visits the Temple Mount in August, and the Waqf guards throw him out. So Dayan says, you can keep nine of the keys to the gates of the old city. I'm going to have the keys in Israeli hands to the Mugrugan map and we can visit. We can't pray, but we can visit. Okay, That was a minor concession, a minor shift. And it also reflected previous realities. And at that point and through much of the period, the Temple Mount remained a non contested site, even though there was a fringe and very extreme uh, Temple Mount movement. Next vignette. I'm in the army in 1980, and I served in Sinai, I served in the Golan Heights, and in between I served a short period of time here in Jerusalem. And I would accompany um, officers under my command to visit the Temple Mount. And I would get there, and at the Mugrabi Gate, there would be an entrance fee charge. That's how the Waqf made their money at the time. And I would have to pay. And I would pay with a payment voucher of the Israeli Ministry of Defense. And somewhere in the archives, you will find the payment voucher. And in the archives of the Waqf, with the stempel of the Waqf on the... And now, I'm not saying this is idyllic. We were occupiers, these were officers, but it was not in your face. It was a dignified and respectful um, um, visit. Fast forward again. Uri Ariel, our minister of construction, who's responsible for the settlement surge, loves to pray on the Temple Mount. And, and, and it's the policy of his government not to allow prayer. It's the policy of the police not to allow prayer. But he does so anyway. It gives you an indication of the state of collective responsibility of the government here in Israel. Now, uh, you may have noticed that for many people, it's not enough to pray. You have to 
show that you're praying. You may have noticed that on an international fight, there's a Hasidic or Haredi custom not to pray under 30,000 feet because it doesn't, it praying under 30,000 feet does not sufficiently annoy the other passengers. So Uri Ariel goes to the Temple Mount and prays. He could pray silently, no. He's got to show everybody he does the priestly blessing. And then he goes on camera and said, I would be delighted in my capacity as minister of construction to build the third temple. I hope it's coming. Now, the visiting hours on the Temple Mount have not changed. The prohibition in ad hoc uh, of prayer has not changed. Uh, but compare my visit with Israeli officers as somebody coming to your home, being begrudgingly invited in, being cordial, have a cup of coffee and moving on to what's happening today, which is the, the tantamount of my coming into your home and saying, look, we're not quite sure whether we want two of the rooms in your house or all of it. And you take out a tape measure and start measuring the curtains because we're going to throw you up. That means that technically uh, and more than technically, uh, Netanyahu is correct. The status quo has not changed, but it has changed enormously, both in the way that it is happening, being lived out in everyday life. But beyond that, for the last millennia plus, the Temple Mount, or the last several hundred years, the Temple Mount has not been a contested site. And it's the integrity of it as a Muslim place of worship has not been in question. It is now in question. I do not justify the violence. I think that there is a murderous streak in parts of Islam, by no means all of Islam, but the concerns that they are displaying are genuine and they're not paranoid. So has there been an increase in the amount of sort of small scale eruption of violence on the Temple Mount oh, yeah. in the last the, four the, months? The, visit, the visits are more numerous, the visitors are more numerous, they're more frequent, they're more visible, and they're more provocative. The, the, visitors, the, the visitors, the Jewish visitors, or the Muslim the visitors? That's right. And don't forget, we live in a nasty neighborhood. Once again, the Temple Mount movement didn't invent the radical political Islam, they're merely helping them. Right. Um, so what are you seeing in Jerusalem, not just on the Temple Mount, but generally? There is there a, there's a greater police presence, a greater police crackdown. There's more, there's more skirmishes between Palestinians living in East Jerusalem and the police. I mean, is this something that is has become commonplace in the last, you know, uh, four months. Four months or so. Almost yeah. Months. Nightly, Jerusalem, East Jerusalem is a flame. Most Israelis are unaware of it because of the separation that I spoke about. Uh, the reasons are varied. Um, for me, the image of what Jerusalem is was comes from August, not far from my home, in the old train station where there was the Jerusalem Beer Festival with, where we would sit around sipping boutique beers. And there's some really good boutique beers these days in Israel. And 400 yards away, 500 yards away, there would be stun grenades, Molotov cocktails, etc. Because Silwan being the epicenter of the conflict. And each tell of two cities, each city oblivious to the other. Well, now there have been incidents, I mean, a horrible incident of yep. the murder last week with the infant and the young woman from Ecuador. This There's is the white rail incident. Still, still the Israeli response to this is, is, is really worthwhile paying attention to because it goes back to the issue that you spoke about, Jerusalem, the undivided capital. Netanyahu and Barkat have had one response to this. Barkat is, is, one. The, that is the mayor, mayor of Jerusalem. Of we will break you. More police. We're going to solve this by enforcement. It's harsher punishments. Punishments. There's the Toys R Us approach to solving this. Boys with their toys, drones and intelligence balloons. And now we are going to be solving it with traffic tickets because today Barkat said enforce building regulations, enforce business licenses, enforce uh, collective punishment. Now, why is this happening? This derives from their empirical detachment. They are completely cut off from reality. They are caught in an in, in ideological bastion of an undivided Jerusalem that exists only in their fertile ideological imaginations. And because Jerusalem is undivided, and these are 
citizens or residents of this undivided Jerusalem, if they do bad things, it is because they are criminals. And they are, they are dedicated not to understanding that the underlying reasons for this are the unsustainability of the nature of Israeli rule. This round of violence may die down. We will eventually find a new state of equilibrium. It will look different from the past. We're not going back. This will be a different city when it ends. Um, I can tell you with total authority, when it dies down, it will be in spite of the policies put in place by Barkat and Netanyahu, which are solely there to break the residents and not because of them. And make no doubt of it, I don't doubt that the police need to enforce law. I don't doubt that they need to contain violence. I myself was the victim of Palestinian violence not so long ago. But having said that, if that is all you do and you don't understand that there are genuine grievances, that they are living lives without future. You know what's fascinating about this round of violence for me? It's being led by 12-year-olds and 13-year-olds, and they're not listening to their parents, and there's no political leadership to listen to. And I ask the simple question, what possesses 12 and 13 and 14-year-old boys to go out, boys notice, Mm -hmm. on a nightly basis and clash with the police? Do you know that? We probably have arrested more than one half of 1% of all of the Palestinian boys under the age of 18 in the last four months. It's it's a stunning number. Now, they don't listen to NPR, and they aren't receiving marching orders from Khaled Masha. Why are they doing it? They're doing it because they're smart kids, and they know they have no future. They know that they're not Israeli, they're not Palestinian, and nobody gives a shit about them. So so when you say... and, 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 And we come in and say... You know, we're going to break you. That's really going to do it. Uh, the, the Palestinians are saying our lives, you know, Thoreau said that most men live lives of quiet desperation. And they're saying our lives are desperate. And income Netanyahu and income Barkat say, we're going to make you more miserable. Yeah, sure. That's going to do it. Right. So when you say it's going to look different after after it's quieted down, in what way will it be? Will there be more checkpoints and more police presence and all of that? The rifts are deeper. Hatred has intensified, been popularized, been personalized in in levels that we haven't seen. You know what's remarkable for me? This paradigm of you know uh, saccharine sweet coexistence that never existed on the light rail. Well, the light rail is targeted. Light rails become the lightning rod of this conflict. Yeah. But even more than the Molotov cocktails and the rocks that are thrown on it, I use the light rail all the time because one of the few Israelis that use the light rail to go from West Jerusalem to East Jerusalem. And I do. When I go from my office to the American colony, to Sheikh Jarrah, to the Ambassador Hotel, as I do often, I use it. And uh, over the last few months, a uh, few months, uh, several months ago, uh, it was used by Palestinians, ultra-Orthodox soldiers, Israelis, etc. The Palestinians don't use it. Mm. Uh, it's become a symbol of oppression. It's become the symbol of their being turned into extras in some sort of um, Petyomkin village kind of coexistence. And they're telling us, we're not going to be extras in your fantasy world. On that pleasant note. Yes. Well, listen. <laughs> Aside um, from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how is the play? <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much for doing this today because I think it was very, um, you know, just your the amount of knowledge that you have about the conflict and the city um, was really helpful for understanding what's going on now. So I appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure.